Who's gonna talk about toffee cherries? Toffee cherries, toffee cherries. Who's gonna talk about toffee cherries? Toffee cherries. It's the Titterpigs. And now it's time for Titterpigs, the RPG podcast. So am I getting paid for this? All right. Hey, welcome to Titter Pigs, the new tabletop RPG with Scott and Keith. We are going to titillate your ears and your brain pan with all kinds of silly RPG nonsense. I am Keith, and this is Scott. And I am Scott. And uh, yeah, welcome to, like as Keith said, the uh, Titter Pigs podcast. Our inaugural event, I guess, is a proper term for it. Yeah, good enough. And, and what we're going to be doing here in the beginning, since this is new, and we're new to the podcasting world, at least I am. As uh, am I. So, so more of a social experiment for us to see how this works out, but uh, hopefully it will take off to, you know, the outer reaches. And we promise you that, um, you know, in regards to our name being Titter Pigs, we will only use, you know, the first three letters maybe twice um, <laughs> within the podcast itself. So, and, and that'll be me with, with the bad jokes throughout the whole thing, because I am a man of certain age and I am allowed to use dad jokes more often than not. Oh, he's good with the dad jokes. Yes. But uh, so, um, so I'll go ahead and let Keith here explain what we're going to be doing first off as kind of like an introduction to ourselves and what it is that we're, you know, doing with this podcast. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna give you a quick snapshot of who we are, and then uh, once we roll out of this segment, we'll roll into the following segment, which is going to be genres we like and dislike personally. Uh, we kind of we're gonna go into some depth into that. Uh, so before we get into that segment, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been gaming thirty five plus years. I started with uh, the old Frank Menser red box set that my parents, I believe it was my parents, bought me for Christmas in 83 or 84. So I've been around the block a few times. I've been a game master almost my entire life. I love a lot of games. I love to play games. I love to read games. I write a lot of reviews. Mm -hmm. Scott will tell you, I write a lot of reviews. Right. The world of RPGs is nothing new to me. I do have opinions. I'm happy to express my opinions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's kind of what Titter Pigs is all about. Uh, It's talking about role-playing games uh, what the games bring to the community, what we as gamers, not just Scott and I, but everybody bring to the to the bigger, broader gaming community. Mm-hmm. So, well, how about a little bit of? I know you you gave a brief description of you know where you come from, but I mean you know I know at least personally that you have a bit of credentials to stand upon. Um, did you want to touch on that briefly? Uh, I mean, I, I guess was, I could. Um, I mean, you, <laughs> you, I mean, you you might as well. Uh, you know, I can always edit this out later. I mean, I guess I could, I'm <laughs> shilling for a living right now, I guess. Um, right. I am the owner and chief blogger at Rolling Boxcars blog. We've been blogging since uh, 2015. So we're in seven years of, of writing game reviews, articles, uh, some expose pieces, all kinds of industry stuff, past news along, things like that. So I'm also a... Uh, I work in the publishing industry as well as a, as a freelance editor, proofreader, uh, I have a specialty with working with uh, foreign language publishers, localizing their products for English language audiences, so so they can bring their products uh, from a foreign language to English audiences, English readers, players. So, but it's specifically the gaming industry. That's my credentials. Fantastic. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it gives it gives a little credence to the show because when it comes to mine, eventually you'll find that uh, there's a little bit of an imbalance there. Uh, you know, as far as you know, two legs to stand on and one person hopping on tippy toes. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, uh, anything else, though, as far as, you know, you want to say about yourself? No, that's that. That's me in a nutshell. OK. So tell right. us about yourself, Scott. Well, what's your uh, origin story? Let's see. Well, let's see. First off, the scientists weren't listening to my father. Our planet was going to explode, but everyone wouldn't heed his call. So shortly thereafter, I was put into a starship. Sorry. Um, I'll continue on. 
so my story is very similar to yours as far as my background is concerned. I am a gamer of many years, uh, you know, 30 some odd years myself. Uh, my first introduction to gaming was at a friend's house where, you know, the uh, uh, his father had a copy of the Dungeons and Dragons blue box or whatever you would like to call it, uh, BX or whatever it is. I'm not a functional historian, so I will mess up on a lot of things. But uh, anyways, and that's where it went off. Uh, second introduction to that was the Endless Quest books. So it's kind of zoomed in and out. But over the years, I, I kind of went the route of certain people is, is I was heavily into gaming uh, up to a certain age. Then uh, puberty hit and other things interest me. And But I still kept my foot within games, whether it be role-playing games or video role-playing games, that kind of thing. So, And then life happened, uh, you know, got married, had children, and like some of us, rediscovered role-playing games at a certain point in their lives. And uh, with that came the knowledge and interest of rediscovering things from my past and also enjoying, you know, what's been going on the past few years of how this, you know, resurgence, so to speak, this renaissance of role-playing games and games in general that have become more inclusive and accepted around several different social circles as, you know, granted, you know, they weren't ever, you know, they weren't necessarily, the rumor of the neckbeard in the basement is is nothing more than a trope and a stereotype. Uh, <laughs> True but, story. But, but to be fair, they weren't as accepted as they were uh, now, you know. And but to be fair, Scott does have a neckbeard and he's recording from the basement. Yes. Um, <laughs> Damn it, Keith. Um, but um, so, yeah, but but what brought me here to the podcast and with Keith is primarily during the beginnings of the pandemic. There was a friend of mine who owned a local game store where I did a lot of my gaming. And due to the pandemic, the con, the local conventions that we have here in Southern California, the only real one we have. Likewise, his game store, we weren't unable to play locally. And I started dipping my toes into gaming online. And that led to me meeting, you know, several wonderfully interesting people, uh, not just within the United States itself, but worldwide. And I guess I've kind of described myself as like, you, you've heard that story, right, of the rock band where like the one drummer or the one musician is that one kid who kind of showed up and never went home. Uh, right, right. And, 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 and eventually he just hung around long enough or people just assumed he was with the band and eventually he was part of the band. That's how my, I describe my ascension into, you know, the RPG world as it stands now. That's a good you way know. to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think a lot, lot of, a lot of our, uh, you know, uh, friends that we know from, you know, either here within the States or across the pond see it that way. It's what does Scott do within the gaming world? Well, he's got, he's got opinions. Uh huh. He's kind of funny. Yeah. But what does he do? He's Scott. He's, he's Scott. He just kind of hangs around. He plays games. He offers to play games. He's, you know, got some interesting takes. Um, and every once in a while, we'll do an occasional meme. But does he write? Does he make? Does he draw? Does he, he's like, I don't know. He just he just never leaves. He's just Scott. <laughs> so, so that's it. Um, I, I've endeared myself uh, in, into a lot of things with, you know, certain, uh, once again, our pond is small, so don't take these to mean more than what they are, but mo certain movers and shakers within the RPG world and whatnot that, that are respected, their opinions are respected, whether it be that they review things, whether that they make things, whatever the case may be. But feel like that the reason why I'm here is to express my joy of what um, I've been experiencing for the past several years. I'm more of the unflappable fanboy. Uh, I'll have critiques about certain games. They may not be as critical as Keese or Focus, uh, but I'm more of the happy, happy, joy, joy guy. And whereas Keith goes, well, I like this game, but there's certain things about it. And I'll go, yeah, but what about the, what about the beautiful colors on page 13? You know, that, that kind of thing. I said, how dare you insult that? Right. You know, so, See, but, we complement each other, and I right. think that's what... Titter Pigs brings to the the podcast world, uh, at least in the RPG scene that currently exists or hasn't right. existed in a while, a right. nice balanced thing. Things are skewed one side or the other. They're super highly opinionated one way or another, or they have a very specific focus where we're kind of looking at going down the middle of the road. 
right. joyfully talking about games and Correct. building the hobby and building the, the community as a whole. And if there's one thing we could use in this world currently is a nice balance of opinions. Absolutely. And respectability in those. Uh, I, I'm not going to let the air... Well, I may let the air out of your tires, but I'm not going to run you over as you're trying to fix that tire based on your opinion. Well, we hope you're not going to run over the listeners. That would that would be bad form. <laughs> I'm talking about you. Oh, uh, me! <laughs> oh, 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 I'm so, so sorry. So I, I guess that, that kind of wraps it up. Uh, you know, obviously one thing you'll find is both myself and Keith can be long-winded depending on the time of day and, you know, where we're at in, uh, in that time of day. But, uh, uh, other than that, I mean, I don't think there's there's much else that we can dive into without uh, you know moving into. So, what do you think listeners can expect from Titter Pigs moving forward after episode one? Uh, okay, well, I'll I'll, I'll say uh, a couple things. I want to say you're going to expect some interviews. Uh, hopefully, we'll be talking with with creators within the, within the RPG uh, world. We'll be talking with other critics. Uh, and reviewers within the RPG world, hopefully other aspects of it, artists, you know, th- things such as that. And also just people like ourselves, you know, people who want to talk about something that they love and enjoy. But also you'll be hearing our own personal opinions on certain topics, um, games come out, you know, things that that, uh, that we've picked up recently that we like or maybe don't like for a variety of reasons. Horrible dad jokes. Uh, that that's going to come with that, and maybe a you know an occasional an occasional minor kerfuffle, as you know there might be a difference of opinions, and you know I will have to find what's what 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 appropriate sound would you use when I'm giving you the bird, Keith? I, I don't know, like a tweet. There you go. The you tweet know. sound. There you go. Uh, or or what what was the sound that Woodstock made? You know, and during the Snoopy something. Cartoon. Yeah, we're gonna have yeah. to get a soundboard. We're yeah, exactly. Have to totally soundboard. get a soundboard. So, but I mean, that's that's what I would like to see and foresee it is is a variety of things, but still down to you and I discussing whatever's on our mind within the RPG and gaming world. Right. So I think that sums it up. We're going to bring you down this journey with us down the middle of the road, discuss games, talk about games, bring in some industry folks, but we're also going to bring in some gamers to talk with us. And hear varieties of opinions. Mm -hmm. We may agree or disagree with those opinions, but we're going to be friendly about talking about different opinions and be open to everybody's opinions. And because it's all about building community and building up the hobby. And again, like like we kind of talked about the joy of gaming. Right. Bob Ross was all about the joy of painting. We are about the joy of gaming oh happy little dice over here what do you oh say? yes happy 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 little 14 page background stories oh no wait where's the paint thinner um <laughs> so uh yeah so that's that's it so i think it's time for us to move on to our next uh segment yep and this will be our topic of the podcast and i suppose we'll see you over there All right, so, hey guys, we are going to uh, give you guys a little brief introduction uh, to further the the topic of who Scott and I are. So we are going to talk about our favorite and least favorite gaming genres. So we have our preferences around the table and for those things that we like to read. So Scott's going to kick us off. Uh, Scott, what Mm -hmm. is your number one top of the heap favorite genre? Okay, well... Just real brief, I just want to make sure for those listening that, you know, we're talking about genres within games. Um, As for me, I'm not going to give any specific type of game, you know, like if I say vampire. That's fair. Yeah. So it's just, these are just going to be genres. And I guarantee you, no matter what we say or what we pick, someone's going to go, that's not a genre. Um, And and so. I can't disagree with that. (laughs) I can't. You know, the, the, the key word, you know, is, is, you know, pedantic. Can anyone say that? Probably my most favorite genre would be, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's like the, the, the gonzo sword and sorcery. So we'll just, we'll just start with sword and sorcery. Um, sword and sorcery is one of my favorite genres because 
growing up, I was pretty much inundated with high fantasy. You know, a lot of, okay. as most of us are. I grew you know, up that way too. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons, say what you will, were from, you know, whatever its foundation, you know, is and what it comes from. And you can list off all the appendix and books that you want. D&D is high fantasy. May not be. Absolutely. Ex- yeah. May not be exactly from the beginning, but it uh, definitely has evolved into high fantasy and almost, you know, what some people call like almost superhero-esque high fantasy. But anyways, that's besides the point. <clears throat> but sword and that's sorcery for a whole nother show. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> um, but sword and sorcery. It just it, I. It's one of those things where I read all of the Forgotten Realm stuff and you know all of the the TSR books and a lot of the high fantasy novels that were around, uh, like the Belgariad and, and things such as that. Uh, and I didn't discover like you know a lot of the actual sword and sorcery books like like Conan and Elric. And, and, and other things as such until until later in life and just realize, wow, because I was under the impression that, you know, a lot of these D&D things were sword and sorcery. I, I wasn't aware that that was a had a specific setting and genre. So after discovering it and, you know, finding out a variety of actual sword and sorcery games within the RPGs, I enjoy the grit of it. You know, the. It's not quite this mud and blood aspect that Warhammer is, but it essentially it is, you know, a man or woman, you know, against possibly not unsurmountable odds, but things that they're not aware of. And just through their sheer will of force and strength and cunning a lot of times, but just a mixture of these things that allows you as a player or players to overcome what normal people can't you know the conan who can roll into a room and you know fight off a giant snake and then wrestle with you know four armed white gorillas and then leap out of the window with the jewel onto a boat and sail off into the jungles of the unknown is a lot more intriguing that to me than flying a magic carpet over the lands of you know neverwhere and having my buddy the luck dragon and you know Tammy, the the happy kitten, next to me. <laughs> and, um, but I have to remember those for, for yeah. game use. But and, and it just it just may be a taste with age. You know, your your tastes like with food, tastes of what your entertainment are and what you enjoy, kind of merge or you know, uh, well mutate <laughs> for lack of a sure, better term. Okay, that's fair. Uh, but it's I just like the the fact that magic is mysterious, dangerous. Something not to not be trifled with, and you may never ex- exactly know where these horrors come from. But the protagonist, even though that um, they're the hero of the story, you're not really a hero. You're not heroic. More than likely, you're there just to barely make it through and survive to the next day. And if you do, you're rewarded, but the, re- the reward is what you went through. You know, because more than likely those golden treasures is going to last you, you know, barely to your next adventure because you're going to drink it off. Yeah, you hope it does. Or, or go carousing. You know, yeah. you're, you're not going to become this famous king who's going to rule over a kingdom and have uh, retainers and a castle and all that stuff. Um, you know, you, you may end up being a captain of a pirate ship and sail off into infamy and, and that, that'll be it. It's just... I kind of gave a general description of it, but it's just... I don't, it's, That's a huge genre, though. It really is. It's yeah. Huge. I mean, so many... There's And, you know, once again, there's so many sub-genres to that. Right. It's huge, like... I mean, so... I'll, I'll piggyback off of that with, like, my, my number one genre, right, mm-hmm. is horror. Okay. Right. So, horror is huge, right? You, you have big mythos horror. You have personal horror. You have jump scare horror. I mean, you have... I mean... Just think of all the different types right. of movies that exist out there, right? You have, and, and and a lot of that has translated over into the role playing game industry, right? Right. With the types of games that are out there, uh, without get without naming names and getting into the different specifics of games. Mm-hmm. For me, it's the the genre itself of horror. Oddly enough, I love horror games, mm-hmm. but I'm not a big horror movie fan. Huh. Okay. Like, uh, my wife is right. She loves horror movies. Always has horror novels. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until into my 
probably my late thirties that I got into like horror movies. I, I was into them in my early twenties. And then it was my late 30s that I got back into horror movies yeah. and novels. There's something about the gaming genre of horror that I really like. It's I think for me, it's more the narrative space. Mm -hmm. The stories we can tell sitting around the table. You know, that narrative space that can be explored. Whether it's... All right, so I'll name some names. Call mm -hmm. of Cthulhu. Right. In the mythos or Delta Green. Both mythos based, but two completely different types of stories being told. Right. Or if we, you know, venture off into, say, dread, you know, very, uh, very different type of stories being told. Right. Or continue into the indie game space with like kids on bikes. Mm -hmm. not, not necessarily horror yeah. in, the, in the grand scheme of things, but you can definitely bend it that way. Sure. So it definitely allows that genre is so big, kind of like the sword and sorcery, right? They intermingle. Big picture. And they, and, they, and they do. They absolutely yeah. intermingle. Yeah. You know, and you kind of touched on it. You know, look at cult. Yeah. Cult borders on a, a cult and horror and personal horror. And, I mean, it, it, it jumps all around and it hits a lot of those areas that are of interest to me. But, yeah, so for me, like, the, the horror genre just gives me so much white space to tell great stories that's kind of what I was going to, you know, interject and just kind of say, yeah, I think, you know, would you say that horror also gives more breathing room if you're a GM? Because... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. It has allowed me as a GM to let my mind kind of just wander in terms of story, just kind of play off what the players are doing, regardless of what the scenario I'm running is or the the framework I'm using I just let the cues the players are giving me I just play off of that it's much right. easier for me as a game master to play off of that than say in a traditional high fantasy game right much easier right because horror horror gives you the opportunity I would say to even modify as you go along because oh absolutely it's expected I mean we yeah. were kind of because of the the way that horrors come up that uh, you know somebody returning for no reason is expected and sometimes anticipated in horror, whereas it may not be in other genres or some people may call shenanigans, you know, right, in certain right, situations. Absolutely. Whereas, you know, if your protagonist comes back from the, from the dead in horror and even likewise sword and sorcery, people are just going to go, it, it's, it's horror or it's mystical or something. They're not going right, to be. And it, may, and it makes sense in those, in that narrative framework, right. you know, in other frameworks, it, you're right. They call shenanigans and go, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So obviously <laughs> you play more, like me, you play more than sh uh, chivalry and sorcery mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, sword and board type games. Mm -hmm. I know you play horror yeah. genre games. So what, if you had to rack and stack them, what would be your number two? Oh, let's see here. Number two... Yeah, because now that I, now that you now that you've mentioned, I realize that sword and sorcery is kind of an all encompassing term for a lot of subcategories that I like. Oh my gosh, it is so much. But I, I think this one kind of stands on its own. Um, okay, and, do tell. And I, I'm a big fan of like the pulp fiction, but not the the fantasy. More of the Indiana Jones pulp adventures. The Bravo. You know, things like, and I'm just going to give a mention here, like, uh, you know, like Hollow Earth, you know, and, okay. and, th and things such as that. Um, and I know, once again, pulp is a very broad stroke. It, it can f fall into a lot of things. But the one thing that I enjoy about it is it, it allows for, once again, the ridiculous to happen within the framework of pulp that wouldn't happen in a more realistic game or even in a, even in a fantasy game. Uh, Scra it continues to scratch your gonzo itch, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, okay. But but it also allows for a lot of humor that is almost a staple of most of these pulp adventures, you know, such as, you know, the, you know, the raiding of the tombs, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it's not all serious. It, it's it's interjected with these wonderful snippets of humor in a lot of games come naturally because it's part of the game or unnaturally just because people are, are breaking the tone, like within horror. A lot of times humor can pop up not because of the game itself, just because people may be getting a little bit uncomfortable and humor kind of levels it out a little bit. Yeah. 
that tends to run deep in in horror right. games anyway. So right, and I and I'm I'm not one of those people who are a stickler for you know we need to be totally immersed for the game to succeed. You know, as long as you're having fun, that's all that matters. And the the occasional humor, which you know, gaming, you know, the, the people we've been gaming with, at least you and I online, t- tends to be a lot of staple for the more for the UK gaming scene. A good joke is thrown in at almost any opportunity and it doesn't spoil the game. Whereas I've seen in more of the, uh, you know, on the US side, there are more sticklers for don't break the immersion, you know, or else, um, or, you know, that, that kind of thing. But yeah, w- once again, you, you'll find, you'll, you'll find, you've known me long enough, Keith, you'll find that I will take a wide tangent to nowhere town uh, when I'm talking. As about will something. I. <laughs> so, As will I. So re- reeling myself back in, um, I, I th- think the pulp what, what what would the term be it's it's not necessarily pulp fiction but for that specific type of pulp the pulp adventure um i would say so i would chalk it up to like a comic book i've i was reading during the pandemic called adventure man a great story okay. a, a female protagonist or uh yeah protagonist character right finds uh, she gets sucked into this very pulpy world mm-hmm. of action early action heroes and, and that's kind of my in my head. That's how I rationalize pulp. They're right. They're, they're a little bit over the top. They're action heroes. They may they're not superheroes by mm-hmm. any stretch of the imagination. Right. They but, could be, but in my head, they're action heroes. Like Indiana Jones to me is an action hero. Right. And but with pulp, luck plays into a lot of things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Kings, you know, King Solomon's Mines. You know, the Mummy. You know, these movies and yep. these these books that uh, right fall into that category you know so it's just once again it's it's grounding to be imperfect but you still have these wild set of abilities and luck that's going to allow you to do these extraordinary things without it being totally just ridiculous and absurd you know so that's maybe that's that's another thing i think and we might might be seeing a a theme here of like you know i i do enjoy my wild you know, forays. No, but I think, fantastic, I think but... the way you have framed pulp originally, I would, you know, coming into this conversation, I would have mm-hmm. said I wouldn't have named pulp as a genre. Right. I would have named it as a subgenre. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I'm used to like pulp Cthulhu or right. pulp this or pulp that. But given given the way you've kind of framed it, yeah, I would. I... You could make you make a good decent argument that pulp is its own genre. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, it falls into this 19, late, you know, early... Late ni- 20s, 80s. early 30s through maybe early right. 50s? Right. Where, you know... Like tech- to Rocket Man. Right, exactly. Like techno- <laughs> you know? technology is is new, but it's not, you know, unheard of. Yeah. But but you were still dealing with superstitions and, the, and we haven't explored everywhere in the world. And usually, at least what I'm talking about, takes place within a semi-realized Earth. But right, like uh, the whole Hollow Earth thing. And... But, I mean, I'd be surprised now, you know, as far as pulp as a genre is the one thing that I mentioned was luck. I'd be shocked if anything that kind of throws itself out there is, yeah, we're pulp whatever, doesn't have a luck mechanic in there. Because I think that's an important part of of what makes pulp. You we'll know, save pulp. that for a whole nother yeah. show yeah. because uh, I'd like to explore that. Yep. But just yes. because mm-hmm. there are a lot of games that use that luck mechanic. Right. Uh, and they're not all pulpy and they're oh, yeah. not all horror. And, you know, they, they kind of go all over the, the map. Mm-hmm. But True. I can name, I know at least one game that focuses on pulp mm-hmm. and it does not use luck. So we'll, we'll hold that to, uh, to a whole nother episode. Wow. Poppycock. Uh, <laughs> all right so, okay. so well then how about you then you I mean you've got your your number two and you know I, I i do think that your your favorites and dislikes are a little bit more focused than mine uh that you do definitely have things that i like this and i like and i don't like yeah. that where i'm more of just like you you're know. very broad brush strokes you know you're like the bob ross of like the role-playing game you like you just like happy trees woohoo yeah, and, 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 and I'm and, like, and an easy I'm date. like the little pine cone on the tree. Like, nope, don't like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah. to to answer your question, my my number two, what I, what what Keith really likes is following horror is a cult. Uh, obviously, you can sense a theme here. A cult to me is something that, uh, as a genre, 
I haven't played a lot of it, but it is something that's really interested me since I was probably an early teenager. Right. Uh, I've read a lot of occult books, like no kidding, real books, New Age books, books on the Golden Dawn, her, you know, other Hermetic Order books. Scott Cunningham stuff on Wicca, and uh, you name it, I have delved into them. Um, uh, as a teenager and then as a young adult and into my adult life. And the subject really fascinates me. I have played a few role-playing games as, as an adult. Uh, Nephilim is, is one that comes to mind. I played mm-hmm. in my, uh, my 20s when I was in the military, and we, we played it quite a bit. Now, I don't know if the game itself is held up to what my memory of it is. I haven't touched it in probably 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do need to go back and, and kind of delve into it and see if it's as good as I thought it was. It's right. probably not, but hey, we'll, we'll see down the road. But, you know, there are other games out there, um, you know, like Desanction and things like that, that have Sigils and Shadows by right. Osprey Press that are, are new to the market that are specifically geared towards occult and urban fantasy, which I will just kind ah. of touch on as my third favorite is urban fantasy. Right. Okay. But I, I do think occult games, at least for me, allow me to further explore my own personal interests mm-hmm. uh, in terms of research. I do have a background in uh, history. Right. Uh, I have oodles of college degrees. One of them is almost finishing, and I someday I'll finish them. Both my ma- both of my master's degrees in history. Okay. So I I do have a natural tendency to delve into historical topics, and I love research, and I mm-hmm. love doing those types of things. So, you know, a, if I get the opportunity to delve into an occult topic, whether it be ghost stories, paranormal, an actual no kidding real world cult death cult Mm -hmm. and and be able to bring those ideas into a horror game or into say cult the role-playing game or something like that Mm -hmm. i'm able to scratch kind of multiple itches at once now similar to what you had mentioned about like like pulp and luck you 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 can have pulp without luck but you know and luck without pulp yep the occult you know that that's to me that that's kind of has got me thinking the wheel spinning because i would consider something like an occult type game to be a sub genre of horror. So can you have like an occult game without it being part of that, that particular genre? Um, I would think so. Yeah. Uh, And the reason I say that is because like your kind of gonzo sword and sorcery, right? is super broad brushstroke. Right. So is horror, right? Right. Yeah. So, the other kind of things that you're like, oh, maybe that's really just a sh- subgenre of what I, you know, chivalry and sorcery, sword right. and board um, type things that I, you already like. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think a cult is kind of in the subgenre area of horror, but I don't know. I, I think depending on the story being told, you could separate the two. Just because it's a cult in nature doesn't necessarily mean it's horror. It's horrific. Right. It could be a story of, I don't know, let's say fertility. It could be a story of a a community coming together through uh, religious means, but non-Western religion, right? Right. Non-Christian means. Okay. That could be a cult. Okay. Uh, But it's not necessarily horror. Right. But generally, the two were, are going to run in tandem anyway. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah. So For the most part, they will run in parallel. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 you know, there are times that I could think of that they would run, they would be divergent of each other. Right. But generally, no. Oh, no. I, I, I read Aldous Huxley's, you know, biography, and it's, <laughs> it's horrific. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> so, okay, um... Well, then, then since you've kind of had the lead into that, we'll go ahead and just kind of, you know, flip flop here. So you're number three and then we'll move into some dislikes. Your number three is urban horror then or or, or urban urban fantasy, fantasy. urban fantasy. Sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Yeah. So I've actually like, so I've said it fantasy, right? (laughs) Right. I no, don't get me wrong. I love sword and board fantasy. I grew like you. I grew up with Dungeons and Dragons in the mid 80s, early to mid 80s. I started gaming in 1983 Mm -hmm. with. Frank Menser's red box set. 
you know, basic. And then I moved, you know, in the whole Beck Me series and all of that. So that's what I grew up with. Mm-hmm. But as much as I do like traditional fantasy, I like urban fantasy, whether it's high fantasy or horror or a cult. But if it's urban based, and to me, this is why it's, it's kind of its own genre to me in my own mind. Mm hmm. It doesn't matter if it's traditional fantasy or modern or or whatever, and then whatever other genre you want to paste onto it. Right. The urban landscape to me is so varied and provides so many opportunities for storytelling and different stories than yeah. dungeon crawling or I'm gonna we're gonna go hex crawling across a landscape that is absolutely the same as it was yesterday and will be tomorrow and it's boring. And we're going to, oh, we found a tomb. Let's go look at a tomb. Oh, we found some monsters. Let's kill some monsters. Oh, look, we didn't die. But in a city, small, medium, large city, Mm -hmm. you have, generally speaking, you have such a varied culture or cultures of people, civilization. You have tiers of or strata of the citizenry, right? Right. You have, just think of like New York City or London or Paris or Berlin today in 2021, right? You have all types of people from all all walks of life, all economic strata, and they are so varied and so colorful. Then you slap on like an occult or a horror or, God forbid I say it, sci-fi theme to it can you can you tell i don't like sci-fi what and, a coincidence but go on um <laughs> yes right uh but you, you you paste on those other uh genre themes to urban fantasy and then you you have this huge landscape in which to play and tell great stories mm-hmm. i mean it's amazing the kind of stories you can tell in in one city and do, do you think, because I mean, I, I enjoy it also, but do you, do you also sure. think that one of the things that you may, that you may not have touched on that you may include in that is um, being able to relate. And, and I, I think a lot of people, when you're dealing with, you know, such, such something like urban fantasy or even urban horror, anything that takes place in a culture that we're more familiar with, or we have something. Oh yeah, absolutely. In, that, I, I would. Yeah, you're, you're, I would absolutely agree. Okay, your investment that, and your immersion comes easier. So, oh, absolutely! Yeah, okay. Like I, I know a lot of gamers that can uh, really get into, say, like westerns or sci fis or uh, the urban urban fantasy. Doesn't matter if it's mm-hmm. modern or or high fantasy, right? Because it's things that they they truly connect with and relate to, right? Right. Or they're super immersed in a horror genre, right? So they can really connect with it and they can help tell better stories. Mm-hmm. That absolutely, for me, urban fantasy is one of those things that I can connect to. I've right. lived in some big cities, short stints in big cities. Mm-hmm. But it is definitely one of those things that I can relate to, at least in modernity, you know, in the, in the right. modern sense, and connect with. And that does definitely convey when I'm trying to tell a story. Okay. All Absolutely. Right. Cool. So, you know, I, I mean, I hit on the idea that I don't like sci-fi. So <laughs> we're going to save that for a second. So, but let, let's kind of flip this whole script yeah. here, right? Yeah. So we've, we've kind of touched on what, what we both like. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, for our listeners, let's flip the script and what don't we like? Okay. What doesn't Scott like in terms of genre? Well, it, what don't you want to play? Well, in terms of genres, the top of the list for that would be, and it may not even be the proper term, but it's what I'm just going to call like vanilla modern games, meaning they take place in the real world, and all you're doing is existing during a time period. You know, things such as you know, uh, 1930s gangsters. Uh, even even though I love you know Weird West things but i don't want to just play a vanilla western game of just you know sh- shoot them up and regular cowboys modern games you know things like um uh, mil- military games T- twilight uh, 2000 comes to mind uh things that um 
I don't know. Just, just they just don't appeal to me. And and it's oh, we're gonna have words. No, I'm and just I mean, I'm, and I'm not saying that I wouldn't play it. Uh, you know, it's just I don't. I wouldn't actively seek it out. Um, nor would I, uh, you know, volunteer usually to play it if there's another option. Sure. Uh, but uh, but I, I think it, a lot of it has to do with just where I grew up. You know, as far as you know, growing up in Southern California in the United States, being surrounded by the modernity of suburban life and just this sucks and it's boring and we just want an escape. You know, the escapism of, well, of going back and being a cowboy or being a gangster or being, you know, uh, um, you know, an untouchable and hunting down those gangsters. Those were the escapisms of my father, you know, in, in prior generations sure. where, you know, to me, it was just kind of making a lateral move. Uh, that wasn't escapism to me. That was more of just I'm just, you know, kind of doing nothing. I'm just pretending right. I'm someone from around the corner or someone from, um, you know, a mile away or, you know, in, in another, you know, in another time. But it, to me, it was just like it's it's almost when I discovered hot sauce. You know, for the first time of just like, wow, I'm never going to eat, you know, anything just plain again. Uh, right, and, right. And, and similar with with the with a little bit of just difference. And and I've played in a lot of modern games, um, but there, there's always a twist like like the urban fantasy type thing. Right. Um, now, I know you and I are both of the same age. Right? right. Yeah. So you and I are the same age. So now I know we both grew up with like Star Wars in the theater mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Now, right. we both know, our listeners don't know, but you and I both know Keith does not like sci-fi games. Right, exactly. But I grew up listening to, I remember my father buying me like, uh, what are they, like the little 45 records or maybe the mm -hmm. 78s of like the Star Wars, like the Ewok village yep. scenes and stuff from Star Wars oh, and yeah. listening to those on some like little cheap plastic record player. Sometimes they sometimes they would come with a little booklet you can follow yes. along. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I would listen to that stuff. Uh, I remember having cassette tapes. So the other thing I don't like is Westerns, right? Because mm. to me, they're boring, right? Westerns right. are boring. Now, like you said, that was your father's genre. That was my father's thing. Right. Right. You know, Howdy Doody and Roy Rogers and all of that stuff. But I grew up listening to my father buying me cassette tapes of The Lone Ranger from the radio hour stuff from the 30s, 40s-ish time period. You, you sure I'm older than you? We're the same age, bro. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> but I'm on. sure of it. Maybe six months <laughs> apart, but I'm sure we're the same age. But those are two genres, like sci-fi genre and Western genre, two genres I specifically don't like. Right. It just they've never connected with me. My other big one is anime. It's just I've played some anime. I, now I've played. Now let's be fair. Mm -hmm. I have played all three of these genres at the table. Right. Anime, sci-fi, and westerns. Okay. I, I have played all three of those. Some of those I have played with you at the table. Yeah. But oh, okay. I, I get the western. Okay, I, I can kind of get that. In fact, I, I get it to where I mean, it's you, you, you. So I know you're going to ask me why don't I like get into the whole sci-fi? Oh, thing. it's not me. I'm sure anyone else who's listening wants to know. Okay, also. So, so let me let me explain. I I can it for me sci-fi. Why I can't get into sci-fi, and this is I have to tell my wife this from time to time. Mm -hmm. My wife loves Ancient Aliens, uh, History Channel, Aliens, show. right? Aliens. <laughs> I cannot mentally wrap my head around the idea of aliens. But I can sure the hell wrap my head around the idea of ghosts and paranormal. Okay. Hence the occult thing. So take it take it for what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. Just like the whole idea of aliens just is a non-starter for me. Hmm. It, it's a little far-fetched. Right. Now, I could be like the odd man out and the st stupidest person in the world because like my neighbor could be an alien. I wonder if my neighbor's listening. <laughs> maybe they are. Maybe they're an alien. I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is it's just never been a genre that's really like, you know, scratch an itch for me. I will, okay. you know, I will play it like I've played with you and I've played with some other of our, some of our other, you know, gaming friends and right. I've had great times at the table. But you haven't had a coming to Ripley moment that what you, where you're thinking, no. maybe I made a mistake. Maybe this sci-fi thing may be for me. So that hasn't happened at all. It, yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, that Eureka moment has not happened yet. Right. Yeah, it came kind of close with the Western and the Weird West because it was kind of Weird West. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, when you ran that, um, oh, what was that game? 
Oh, uh, the used to be Dark Trails, Weird, Weird Frontiers. Weird Frontiers, yes. Now. Yes. Uh, so that was close, but that was because it touched on uh, like yeah. a little bit of the gonzo, a little bit of the horror. You know, it kind of bordered and it, it touched into some other areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would have to play it again, and we'd have to have Frau Blucher come back. But that's a whole nother. That's that's for a whole nother episode. Frau when Blucher we get, is when we get Frau stable. Blucher as a special guest, right? Um, but um, but yeah, anime. Okay. Yeah, I just the uh, whole art style, the culture around it. Not oh, I my get cup it. of tea. Oh, I get it. You know, my I, son loves anime. Has not my thing. No, I, I uh, trust me. I, I get it. I, I'm, I. You know, big eyes, small mouth is something that I wouldn't actively seek out either. Um, right. I'm not appalled to it. My my anime predilections were more of the 80s, um, uh, you know, takeovers that I grew up with, you know, Robotech and, um, you know, Battle of the Planets and things such as that. But any anything outside of that into real anime. See, uh, and even for me, that bordered on sci-fi. Too much sci-fi for me. So too much like, sci-fi and anime. The, the worst. Yeah. <laughs> so ah, somebody got... a Western in there and I was like vomiting, you know? Oh, boy. <laughs> somebody definitely got their chocolate and your peanut butter and you weren't eating either. No. Uh, so, I mean, I get it. And so, all right. So I'm, I'm going to give you one more and this is going to be an odd one because I know this, okay. is, this is going to probably surprise some people who know me and also may kind of scratch some heads but i am not a fan of and now mind you this is in games i am not a fan of playing superhero games and the primary reason for that is one i haven't found one that i don't feel like that out of all the games where it's just like okay i'm gonna just suspend my disbelief right uh, okay. which which occurs in in all games. I mean cuz you know, if that's, you know, if if you have a problem suspending disbelief, then you shouldn't be playing a particular game. And for me in a superhero game, it's always hard for me to imagine that as a superhero, I'm starting out with next to nothing and then over a long period of time and leveling up and doing these variety of things that then I'll become Superman. But but if I'm playing in a superhero game where I start out as a Superman, then what's the point? Because I'm going to be able to overcome most anything. And it's just, it just always, it's just one of those little things that almost hard to describe. And maybe I just haven't played the right game yet. Cause my experience with superhero games is not broad, but you know, like mine with Westerns or anime is not right. broad. So okay. it's just, I mean, to me, there, the games haven't really, from what I've read in all of my comic books that I enjoy superhero comics, I should, I should, you know, um, uh, detail, but in my reading of those, none of the games I played in can adu- adequately bring that over. Because one, uh, in order for it to happen, it would have to be a gigantic railroad. You would have you would lose quite a bit of your player agency, not because of the game master, but just because as a player. Because you you are trying to get from point A to point B to, you know, you're go- you're flying you up. Need to- the, you need the Deadpool role playing game. Well, yeah, you know, but then, then that, that falls into Gonzo. But it just, I don't know, it just it just doesn't seem like it translates well. I mean, wanting sure. to be a superhero, yes. Wanting to be able to have these superpowers and fly, and that's the same thing as all the other games. I want to swing a sword and lob off a head and cast fireball and, you know, turn into a werewolf and all that stuff. But... Oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah, it's just, that genre is not one of my favorites either, and you, yeah. you personally know that. Yeah, but. but it's just, it just, I don't know, to me it's just the... The real comic book superhero to me just doesn't translate into that. I mean, it's fair. And you'll find it. You'll find it in current D&D 5e. I mean, 5e, within a few levels, you are now a superhero. You're just wearing armor or cloak and casting spells, but you are a group of X-Men, you know, with a set of... In a sense, yeah, you said it are. Almost almost unbeatable. Um, and And it works there. But for some reason, in some of the the games that I played um, or have touched upon, it just it just it just hasn't. And and maybe and it's been a long time. Kind of maybe like like you, it's maybe been a long time since you played a Western or a sci-fi. I should try it again. But um, as much as I want to seek it out and, and try it, it's just bottom of the barrel of what. Uh, oh sure, what I mean, I, let, let's face it, our. We're adults. We have jobs. We yeah. have the other things that we do. We have this podcast. I mean, our time is is limited and it's valuable. I mean, right. if I've got to decide, do I want to go explore a Western game that, meh, 
might excite me or probably not or go play a horror game that I know I'll enjoy. I'm going to probably go play the horror game I'm going to enjoy because my time is very limited. And to me, it's valuable. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's a good spot. We are going to wrap this uh, segment up for everybody. So we just to kind of wrap it up, encapsulate it. We have covered what we both like and dislike as Mm -hmm. far as our favorite genres and our least favorite genres. A few. I mean, yeah. Uh, A few. I mean, there are obviously others. (laughs) We've touched on some of that. Like superheroes for Keith. <clears throat> and a- anthropomorphic animals for me. But yeah, that's that's a whole segment itself. Oh, we're going to have a special <laughs> segment on anthropomorphic games uh, just for just for Scott. Yeah. And we're going to have some special guests for that one. Okay. Well, he doesn't know it yet, but he does now. All right. We're going to roll on to the next segment, so we'll we'll catch you there. Ah, yeah, is this Titter Pigs? I got a special delivery for you. Yeah, sight right here. Shh! Keep it down. This is like the third delivery this week. (laughs) Mommy! Daddy's hiding some more books from you. Ah, sh! (laughs) Yeah. Well, welcome to Special Delivery. Uh, this is where Keith and I are going to talk briefly about a couple things that we received, you know, in the post, uh, or maybe picked up and purchased, or, uh, even just from the generosity of, uh, certain people just, you know, handing us over something new, uh, that we're excited about. Uh, just maybe give a, you know, a little brief description of it, tell you a little bit about it, and, you know, maybe, uh, what it was that, you know, brought it to our attention. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and we'll start with with you keith uh we'll go ahead and see what's uh you know what was eating at your wallet that you just had to order while completely sober and not making any purchases while inebriated oh wow okay (laughs) so actually this one goes back this one dates back to november 2020 Mm -hmm. it's a kickstarter uh that actually showed up in uh in the post yesterday um so while i was uh touring the local historic sites with a with a friend that was in town, uh, we were at a uh, American Revolutionary War site, mm-hmm. uh, local history site, and uh, Flames of Freedom, um, powered by Zweihander, showed up. So the whole Kickstarter package. Oh. So big monster book showed up, and I mean this thing is a beast. Six hundred odd pages, you know, somewhere right around six hundred, six hundred ten pages of um, crazy goodness. Okay. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, it's powered by Zweihander, which uh, those that like it or don't like it, it's kind of a, uh, the base game is kind of a clone of sorts. Okay. I'm going to probably get some hate for that, of um, early first, second edition smash up of <clears throat> Warhammer uh, with the serial numbers filed off because there's no um, uh, copyrighted trademarked lore in it so right right um now and then they took uh the individual took it and then they um took colonial gothic that's what the I was original ask. rpg yep. colonial gothic mm-hmm. yep uh and they turned it into uh they retooled it with uh the the zweihander engine powered by zweihander and now it's flames of freedom okay so the entire package comes with the the monster book uh beautiful beautiful book gm's shield a cloth map, okay, which is two foot by three foot. It's it's nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, a set of uh, two sided metal coins and a set of dice. So I mean, this is a whole package deal, right? Um, you know, and I mean, I think with shipping, it was uh, on the Kickstarter early bird special. With shipping, it was it probably cost me like ninety dollars. I mean, it was a steal. Hopefully, it's waiting in my post box because i I backed it also but uh, as we know shipping that's right you did shipping you know when it comes to these certain things um you know you never know uh it depends on what uh you know what what parcel or what uh grouping you go out with so yeah yeah i i I literally got the shipping notice two hours after the postman dropped it off at the house so you know cool um so that was the that was my big delivery um this week what what did you get so I'm just going to go ahead, and this is one thing that um, uh, I recently received. This is a Kickstarter, and this is one that um, 
Uh, it's it's uh, for use with Mothership. And, of course, Mothership is, is kind of one of those things that um, are very similar to uh, currently like Mork Bork. Uh, every other day, someone's squeezing out another Kickstarter for the system. And right oh, my God, yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic, easy system. I just recently ran it at, um, at uh, Gateway Strategicon and uh, had a blast and had new people playing it, and it's fantastic. And there's a lot of stuff to do with it. But, you know, a lot of it kind of maybe a little bit recycled and you know a lot of it maybe r- runs a little long in the tooth especially when it's like you know, it gets to the point if you've seen one you've seen them all as far as a lot of the kickstarters but this one seems to be a little different uh, desert moon of karth and what's uh what's really neat about this and, and keith be sure you can plug your nose if you like because we're dealing with with two things now that you may not uh, enjoy too much is one, of course, it's science fiction. Uh, Mothership tends to focus on a more of science fiction horror. Uh, but I like Mothership. Uh, well, so well, there you let's go. Let's be clear about okay, that. Okay, well, it's, maybe it's the horror thing. that, that you know that, It is. But the cool thing about Desmond of Karth, just set a quick little page through, is it is also sci-fi western. Um, it, it, uh, it, it looks like it may be dealing with a, uh, a bounty hunter situation. Uh, and uh, where you may be playing bounty hunters on this particular, you know, moon. Uh, flipping through it, it looks like it would be a great little short campaign to run to kind of feed that itch without playing a lot of the larger licenses like Firefly or, or whatnot. But um, but it's, it's, it's really well presented. It's very easy to read. It's not done in that red and black and purple dynamic that makes it hard for those with uh, aging eyes and who are colorblind to read it's just straight black and white and it seems to have its own um you know identity uh within its uh within its book it's it's even though it's based for use with mothership you, you can all you know what i mean where you can almost tell like yeah. you know you open up something and it's like oh this is mothership without even looking at the the, the cover this one might 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 take you some time. You may definitely pick up on the sci-fi vibe, definitely pick up on the um, the western vibe. But but aside from that, it, it looks different. It looks exciting, and definitely looking forward to hopefully trying this out soon. So yeah, Des- Desert Moon of Karth. Have no idea if you can pick this up through Exalted Funeral Funeral yet, which I assume that would be where you would probably get it for the most part. But uh, definitely worth uh, the Kickstarter for sure. That's cool. Okay, so I, I would probably like it just because. Okay, Western bit aside, just because it's Mothership and I like Mothership. Yeah, so. easy, easy system. Yeah. yeah, the other thing I recently got was actually one of the one of the publishers I uh, I get books from periodically to do reviews sent me the actually the first book in the series and uh, of their um, of their Meatlandia series. Oh, okay. Uh, so for, for those that are familiar with it, this is the, the Chaos Gods Come to Meet Landia, the second edition. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm looking forward to reviewing this. I've reviewed the first two or the book two and book three in the series in the in the because there's only three books in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, but oddly enough, I started with book two, moved on to book three, and then I get book one to review. So mm-hmm. um, this is for use with old school essentials. So it's designed for that game engine so for the old school folks out there this is you know uh something that may you may want to put on your radar take a look at it's published by um night owl publishing um you can look at rolling box cars and see reviews of their other two books just search on my site for night owl publishing and the other two will pop up cool but yeah um I'm a sucker for anything old school essentials. So, <laughs> um, and the Meatlandia series is is it's got such a weird vibe to it that I'm um, I'm excited to to dig into this. I just haven't had the time yet to right. like, crack the book. Right, because once again, similar to a lot of the you know Mothership, Morkborg, a lot of those kind of have the same flavor to them. You know, as far as any right, third party right. offerings, so it's nice to someone utilize that that tool set and do something different with it. Um, so. Uh, what cat? <laughs> yeah, cat. Hey, you know what? Yeah, this. We're not freaking professionals, so you know. I'll, I will just clip that part. I'll, out. I'll, My cat's rubbing on the mic. Boom. I'll edit what, out what I can, but you know, if <laughs> if it's funny, I may leave it in. So yeah. But uh, okay, well, Cthulhu's making an appearance on on audio. <laughs> so here's one that I picked up, and th- this one I don't know. 
Um, I know nothing about it. Uh, this was one of those late Friday night. I'm just going to go ahead and look at a couple things. And this was still when the uh, the Ennies hadn't completed yet. And, you know, the, say what you will about the Ennies. You know, like them, hate them, or can think they're sure. good or bad. Uh, it is, regardless, a gateway to other games uh, because of what's listed on there. It's not always going to be, you know, D&D, the top publishers, the top games. Every once right. it's going to toss somebody something new that they've never seen before. And so one of the games that were listed on there, which I believe had a couple offerings, but one was maybe Game of the Year, I'm not going to look it up right now, is Slayers. Um, Slayers is, it was an inexpensive purchase, uh, you know, created by Spencer Campbell of Gila RPGs. Check out GilaRPGs.com, which if we didn't reference, likewise, if we didn't reference any of the authors, we can either, I can add it in the notes in the, uh, in, in, in every Yeah, we'll show yeah. note it. But, um... So what Slayers, the premise is, is you are on the back. You are a Slayer. You're a monster for hire. The city is cursed, compelled to expand towards the horizon for eternity. It's Slayer, be slain, better get to work. So with that, you can kind of gauge what it is. You know, it's it's it looks to have like that Victorian city monster hunter flair. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I haven't read through it yet, but, you know, you're a Slayer. Um, and uh, depending on different archetypes, you're going to go out and slay monsters or whatever horrors hidden in the shadows protect the mundane from blah 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 it's not so it's a new take on like the the whole monster hunter vibe probably the genre of monster hunter probably yeah and and yeah, okay. now granted on the you know from a general appearance if i was flipping through this on drive through or this book was kind of you know in the shelf somewhere more than likely i probably wouldn't have picked it up but because you know enough people care to set it up as um, you know, as an offering on the Ennies, I figured, well, it, it might be worth it. So, you know, okay. so don't say that the, you know, the, you know, if the, that the Ennies aren't influential. Exactly. Exactly. In some way. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I, you know, hopefully that, uh, a- after I'm done reading it and no offense to, you know, Spencer Campbell of Gila RPGs, but hopefully once I'm done reading it, I, I hope I still feel that way. Um, <laughs> so that's fair. Uh, but yeah. Do you have anything else, or is just just have, have no? A couple... That was those were okay. kind of the the two uh, the two deliveries, uh, you know, over the last week or so. Perfect. Um, I mean, I get stuff all the time, like, like you do. So, yeah. Um, you know, we'll have to we'll have to see what the what the mailbag has for special deliveries next time. Yeah, I mean, we keep we're you know once again this is our you know um, inaugural venture forth, trying to keep it simple, see how it plays out. So yeah, but these are a couple things that we're excited about. We bought it for a particular reason, and next time we do a mailbag, there will be other things, you know. And it may, yep, and it may, absolutely, and it may, and it may not be something new. It could be something, you know, old that we decided to buy because we've never played it before, or some whatever reason. So there'll be a variety of things that will come through, not just kick t- kickstarters and new games and things like that. Just whatever shows up in the mail, uh, unless it's addressed to my wife. Um, so because I'm not allowed to open those. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might have sent packages for you to, uh, via your wife before. I yeah, might be guilty of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Never open anything from Keith unless you want to. You know, unless you're obligated to play something you may not want to play. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 I, I, I am one of those people that it, as soon as a package opens and it's a book, it, it's stuck. It's stuck with me. I, I can't get, get rid of books. I don't throw away books. Um, so if, if, you know, so if you have a game you don't want, you know, send it to Keith, what's your PO box? Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave that in the show notes. Perfect. <laughs> PO. All right. So anyways, yeah. we'll, we'll wrap this segment up, but if you want to, we'll put show, in the show notes, we'll put links to, um, all of the books mm-hmm. that we've just mentioned, yep. uh, to, uh, the publishers and, uh, creators, uh, in the show notes. So check them out there mm-hmm. and show them some love. Cool. Well, that's it for uh, Special Delivery, and we will see you guys next time we have something in the mailbag. Yeah, so hey, uh, everybody, we appreciate you listening to Titter Pigs episode uh, number Mm -hmm. one. Uh, yep. So, you know, hey, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for listening and our ramblings and our kind of explanation of what it is we, 
who we are, what it is we want to do, yep, uh, and where we want to take this thing. So I personally appreciate you being on the journey with us. Uh, I look forward to getting some some feedback from everybody. Yes, especially Keith. So you look for Keith's email in the show notes if you have any complaints. Yeah, we have send uh, it to Keith. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, we'll have a we'll have an email. You can send uh, you can send feedback uh, via the email in the show notes. But as far as show notes, we're, we're going to list uh, like you heard in the special delivery section. We will list everything that we reference it throughout the show mm-hmm. um, as best we can. We're going to list it in the show notes. Publisher sites, products, all of that stuff. Please show these publishers and these games some love. Yes, um, 100%. All, at least for me, it's about building community. and, and Oh, yeah. And, and, and like anything, we're open to, su- to suggestions. Heck, yeah. This is new to us. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, much, much like my 14-year-old son, we are discovering ourselves. Uh, wait, ignore that. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Put that out. <laughs> Cut it out. Cut it out and post. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I mean, any in, you know, to to our friends who actually have podcasts, to you know, people who have any you know insight, you know, or comments, throw it our, our way. We're definitely open to you know manipulate and maneuver, maneuver this thing into you know what we want it to be, and that's just to you know provide some positive uh, information and resources for the gaming world. You know, without it, you know, trying to keep it as on task as we can without rambling forever and i'm going to shut up um i'll take us out of here so again thanks for listening to titter pigs this is episode <laughs> one uh yep. welcome to our journey of discovery Until yes next time we will see you in episode two see you then That's it for another episode of Titter Pigs. Tune in next time to see what we're up to. This podcast is copyright Titter Pigs 2021. The outro music is entitled West in Africa by John Bartman and is in the public domain. Until next time, happy gaming.